Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Todd Hunt of TM Hunt Custom Knives. Todd is a custom knife maker whose work I showed off on the podcast and on the channel here in the form of the brain shovel based on his ring pop knuck platform. And this was a collaboration with Ed Saul, who's also been on this show. Todd is known for his robust and refined field knives and EDC fixed blades. But the knife that really put TM Hunt custom knives on the map is the M18, a startlingly cool and unique bush knife capable of doing the work of numerous different woodland tools uh, all in one knife. We'll talk about the birth of this iconic blade and the man who makes it. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Download us where you listen to podcasts. And be sure to join us on Patreon if you want to help support what we do here. It's greatly appreciated by Jim and myself. Best way to do that is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check out what we have. That's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Todd, welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. Thank you for having me. It's it, it's nice to uh, finally uh, get up with you. I know you and I played uh, tag a bunch here and there, getting back and forth, but uh, it's nice to finally be here. Yeah, and it's nice to finally meet you too, uh, especially ha after having uh, the brain shovel, uh, the last one <laughs> in my uh, hot little hands for quite a long time. Thanks for letting me uh, borrow that, but that... That thing, uh, very cool. Congratulations on selling that out. Oh, thank you. Uh, that was uh, it was uh, just a, a fun project. I'm sure we'll get more into it here in a little while. But uh, uh, things that uh, Ed and I look forward to do together to kind of uh, uh, get our creative juices going, I guess, and uh, some things uh, to help him uh, as far as. Uh, being able to repeat stuff so it was just a fun project I was, I was uh we had a lot of fun doing them after we did uh we did accidentally uh you know some of those things are always you know just kind of like playing around i've made some double-edged stuff before but uh uh ed really hadn't so um we got to play and he got to uh uh, screw up a little bit of steel and get a little bit of aggravated so all those things are all good but yeah it was a fun project well, what, what does that look like, collaborating with another maker of, uh, of tools and physical goods? Well, um, a little bit with Ed. I, I just really kind of got uh, lucky with him uh, because how we do it is, uh, you know, I, I just moved into a bigger shop here a couple of years ago. And uh, one of the things that I wanted uh, with the new shop was I needed to get some help in here. But uh um, you know, in a knife making shop, somebody doesn't really just hit the ground running. So, um, you know, Ed got with me and, uh, he wasn't very far away. So the cool thing about him is, uh, Ed, Ed doesn't really need for say a mentor. He just needs more practice. And I've got all the practice in the world for him. Cause I've got a lot of stuff for him to do. So, uh, you know, I've got my knives, he's got his knives. And then when we get together, uh, we have like our stuff that we do. And I try to uh, make it to where it's things that he can learn from, uh, you know, the repetitiveness and being able to do small batch builds. So, uh, I, I got really lucky with Ed. So like when he comes around when we try to figure out these projects to do i kind of get to think of uh, things like i wanted to get him uh practicing on double edge uh making double you know the symmetry with double edge grinds and whatnot so we decided uh to do uh those so uh it, it, to answer your question to string it out a little bit uh it's it's a lot of fun for me and it's it's uh probably more so for me because i get to make up the projects it's like, all right, Ed, I think you need to work on this. So I'm going to uh, think of a project that's going to incorporate a lot. And um, 
you know, a lot of times the only way we ever get better at anything is just, you know, repetitive motion, repetitive motion, and then, you know, doing it over and over and over again. That's how I'm trying to instill that in Ed is, you know, get it down to where you've done it so many times. And, you know, it's once it's mastered, and then you kind of sneak up on it. I, I'm, I'm probably rambling, but uh, it, to, to answer your question, what it's like to do with other people, uh, sometimes, you know, egos get in the way. There's there's nothing like that at all with Ed because he's, he's such a sponge as far as wanting to, to learn how to do things better. So uh, in this instance, it's a lot of fun because I kind of really get to make all the rules. So... Well, I, I I want to uh, I want to go back in time in a minute and and ask you how you got started and all this. But before we do, something that Ed mentioned when I was talking with him, and when I had the uh, brain shovel in my possession. By the way, if you didn't, it was on the brain shovel. It's based on uh, Todd's ring pop knuck. Uh, except it's got a double-edged blade coming off of it. Anyway, when I had that, we were talking about the Apex uh, steel, uh, that special steel that you were using. Yes. Well, um, I got that. It was something that Ed had uh, had accumulated from somebody that he was really interested in. And I, 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 to be honest with you, I'm not the best one to ask. It was something that he wanted to try, and he had uh, – uh, four big bars of it. Now that was actually what I was talking about. We had, we had ruined one bar through, um, some, uh, questionable techniques, I guess you could say, like I said, we was, we was trying some other things as far as cutting these out and, uh, we, we screwed one up, but as far as that particular steel, um, uh, Ed was, uh, intrigued with it because of the, the, uh, hardness you can get with it and he had never tried heat treating it before uh nor had i and it's a, a carbon steel so therefore i had some interest in it and um man it's just uh i i can't tell you even before we even tried to uh to put any heat to it at all just cutting it it's just uh, the stuff is just super hard. And from what I understand, it can take like uh, mid 60s Rockwell, like 64, mm. 65, so, uh, and, you know, even not have uh, brittleness problems. But um, we made these out of those and we got these things. Um, we got these things hard, uh, very hard to where um, I don't think that the application that we made these out of like i said these were all just an experiment there was something that we was uh playing with and something that was fun and then the apex ultra was something that uh ed kind of added in there at the very last second because it was something that he had that we tried i don't think that you know these things are uh i believe the brain shovels i believe those were three sixteenths of an inch thick now usually I make those out of the uh, 01, the quarter inch 01. And the reason I make those out of quarter inch 01 is because those are actually cutoffs. Uh, I water jet those out of cutoffs of my big M18 that you was talking about earlier. And uh, these were thinner because that was what uh, he had. Mm -hmm. And um, I just remember it being extremely difficult to cut out extremely difficult it wasn't extremely difficult to heat treat but it was a little bit more labor intensive and these things are hard man I'm, i mean they're like in 64 65 points and for that application i mean this is a i guess you can consider this a uh blunt force uh, uh tool mm -hmm. you know so I guess if you're hitting center blocks or something with this thing, I, I you know, you got to break your hand too, probably. But I, I mean, the, I guess what I'm getting at is this thing is, is completely tougher than anything that you can possibly uh, throw at it. And then some probably, it was probably a little bit of overkill doing it with the apex, <laughs> but it was what we had and we wanted to but try it at the time. I would argue the entire design is overkill, which yeah, is, yeah. is all right by me. Let's talk about the M18. Um, yeah. I, I, 
before I knew your name, I knew that design, which is, yeah. uh, which is good. Uh, in, in my opinion, that's like, uh, that's a good calling card for a designer slash maker, which is what you are. You are a maker. You make these things by hand. Um, do you have one at hand? Uh, you are going to laugh at me uh, because the only one that I have at my hand is actually I've, I've made some uh, limited edition ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm not at my shop right now. If it's not obvious, it's, it's, uh, it's across town. And so all my stuff's out there. The only thing I have here is a couple of little knickknacks. I've got one that I actually made my daughter that's pink and white <laughs> but uh Let's yeah i did I, I do have one this oh. one uh was a limited edition one i made two of these one for my wife and one for uh my daughter uh these are uh white they're serial numbered uh this one's two of two and then these handles uh this was a limited project that i did with dan eastland of uh oh, yeah. uh and these actually glow uh this tiffany blue so how cool oh, but anyway there's so, only two two of these white ones and this one's my daughter's here it's it, uh, it's i gotta say to see this in white but i'm gonna have you hold that up and and hold it still in a second for the camera but to see this in white um i mean when you see it in its in its normal state which is kind of looks almost blued or it's like very dark you can see the different uh grinds the hollow grind where that recurve is and then the 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 grind all the way up the front it looks so much more serious when it's not in white and pink yeah uh, look at this monster what tell tell us about this knife and uh and and its origin and and how you make it how this all came about the m18 was um oh i wasn't even full-time i i went full-time in 2013 so uh well 10 10 years now so um a friend of mine by the name of Corey murphy um who uh he's a retired marine he uh used to go to uh the get the gatherings that uh, ethan becker had on his property i'm sure you know who ethan becker is and um he invited me to go and and i wasn't full-time knife making at the time but uh uh cory was one of my best friends uh still is and he was big into this uh weird knife that I never could get into uh, designed by a man by the name of Tom Brown called the tracker. I'm sure everybody's cons you know, heard about that knife. And uh, as everybody kind of was back then, uh, Corey was into that movie, uh, the hunted with, uh, Oh, I know I'm going to say his name wrong. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones. And what is it? Uh, Benicio Del, Del Toro. Del Toro. Yeah. 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 So, uh, Corey was real big into that knife and, uh, he had came back, uh, he was in the Marine Corps and he had came back from, uh, Iraq and, uh, he wanted one of those made and I made the knife and I basically what I did was I took a set of, uh, Becker handles off of a knife that he gave me because he was friends with Ethan and he really liked those handles. And he said, use these on the knife. Well, I made the knife and to make a long story short. It was absolutely horrendous. I hated the knife. Um, and a lot of that, I'll be honest with you, is because I didn't really understand it, to be totally honest with you. I didn't understand it at the time. I, I saw something that I thought was, it looked like a knife that was made to chop, but then it was made to be uh, uh, compact, which I didn't understand. And it just confused me and I thought it was horrible. And so when you take a concept that you think is horrible and you try to do something better with it, it just really totally screws it up even more. And that's what happened with that knife. And hmm. I just, I never did like it. So I thought, you know, and the thing of it was, when he when I got that knife done, he took it and he showed it to everybody. And I hated it because I thought, man, that is not a good representation of my work. I don't like that knife. I don't like the design. I don't understand the concept. I thought it all sucked. So I thought, well, if he's going to take around, run his mouth and show everybody this, at least I can think I could do something that, you know, would... I wanted to make my version of what I thought that knife should be. 
And like I said, uh, out of all honestness, a lot of what I thought that knife should be out of the, at that time was ignorance. I didn't understand that knife. So I made a bigger uh, version of it with uh, things that I had in mind as far as what I would do with it. I, you know, I'm old uh, Indiana boy and, uh, you know, hunting, fishing, camping, you know, being outdoors. That's what people you know, around here do. And, um, uh, I just made it with, uh, uh, something in mind to have, uh, you know, um, every, every place, everything has a function, uh, basically not a one, one knife does everything, but, uh, or not one knife replaces everything, but it's one tool that you can do. It's not the one tool that you want to replace everything, but it's one tool that you can get by with if you had it. Let's, uh, let's start from the pommel and work forward because I look at this knife and <clears throat> I see something that's really cool. Uh, and looking at it through my lens, it would be a... Uh, well, let, let's just find out what, what are all, all the, right. what do you do with this thing? Well, um, this one isn't set up anymore cause it's been robbed of all the stuff, but, uh, uh okay. So, so just to start. And like I said, when I, when I go through these and uh, there's going to be people that are going to say, well, it, it wouldn't be very good for that. It wouldn't be very good for that. It wouldn't be good for skinning a deer. No, it wouldn't be the exact thing that I would take, but if it was the only thing I had, you know, it can be done. So gotcha. with that, with that in mind, uh, you know, the handles people say, uh, if you remember me saying the very first one that I ever made was right before I went, uh, I wanted to have a new knife. So the, the very first one that I ever made was, uh, the one that I made the very first time I went to, uh, Ethan Becker's, uh, gathering. And so I had, uh, Becker handle scales, on the first 16, I think, that, of these that I made. Um, and then, of course, after that, I changed the design a little bit and then uh, got into to where I was water jetting these and that all changed and whatnot. But these aren't the same as, as Becker scales now, but they used to be. Um, so anyway, starting back here, uh, it's just an exposed pommel. Uh, you know, if you had to you know, crush something. Uh, I always think of not that we have a lot of coconuts in Indiana, but <laughs> I mean, if you, you know, you had to, uh, and then, you know, just basically from starting back from there, uh, usually these have lanyards on them with a bead that is adjustable. And the reason I put those on there is the, so like if you have this in your sheath and these, these are all set up for, um, uh, like Molly attachments or belt attachments or, uh, tech, lock. uh, tech locks. Yeah. So you can carry this many, many different ways. I don't put these on my belt, but I put them on my pack or I got one in the truck actually, but if it's on me, it's on my pack. Um, so anyway, then those lanyard tube, those lanyard holes will, uh, lay freely down and then you can also, then you can pull that and then you can put the lanyard around here. And again, it's hard for me to show this without there actually being one and you can support the weight. And then that's what the, this up here is for. You okay. can actually, uh, choke up on it and you can use this and find like, for example, like we hang our deer. Uh huh. And okay. Oh, yeah. Wow, that's and cool. so yeah, it can be and you know, you can, you can skin out that way and this holds the, uh, the uh the weight of the blade and, and that's what have... that jimping is for at the very end of the blade too exactly you. yeah all right so if you're if you're listening and and not looking and you're wondering how the m18 the the big uh tm hunt custom knives m18 bush tool which you've probably seen um how you can actually skin a deer with this uh he's saying that you actually attach the lanyard around your forearm almost near your elbow and yeah, use and that, that little hole at the at the tip, and you have fine control over the tip of this huge knife. Right. Cool. And uh, another way you can do, like for uh, bone joints, like uh, on like the elbows, mm -hmm. you can put this. It's kind of shaped, kind of like a guillotine, right on elbow joints. And then you got this back here. You can batten right through el elbow joints. Oh, yeah. 
and it's just really easy to and that that's just like for cleaning a deer and then you know like the you got the uh the hollow ground area this is rounded so i mean it, it works really nice as a spoke shave as well uh this i actually put there to take pots off of the fire when oh. you're cooking so i tried to iterate something in every little corner i wanted there to be something useful everywhere you looked at the knife and so i i, I don't i don't I'm, I'm not here to dish on the tom brown tracker i'm not a fan uh but i'm not a tracker and i'm not an outdoors uh i do remember taking exception to the knife being used as a fighting knife in the hunted <clears throat> because i wanted to see something else uh but how how in what ways does does the m18 improve on the tracker and what were the things about the tracker that you liked uh that you that you tried to bring into this design well again like i said when i very first kind of got into into uh this and fooling around with this i was basing it on what i thought the tom brown tracker knife was like uh to your point in the movie the hunted it was used uh it was used as a utilitarian type type knife but it was also used primarily uh as a fighting weapon which um this isn't designed as a fighting knife um i i you know designed it around you know what we discussed as far as uh, versatility and being able to use it in outdoor activities as far as uh you know a, a fighting knife this ain't this isn't it uh as far as like like compared to the tom brown tracker um i have held a tom brown tracker a few times and I, like i said uh once i really understood uh what it was about and how it how it uh worked i immediately realized then that i made the m18 too big <laughs> <No>. <laughs> which is what i thought was because like i said i thought you know when i very first saw the 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 tom brown tracker i thought that it was too i i thought that it was a chopper made to be compact which that actually isn't the truth that's not what that knife was for and so when i improved on that version of the tracker i just made it bigger to give it more mechanical advantage this mm -hmm. thing chops like an axe yeah. because it has the mechanical advantage of this four inch section uh here um it, now are you going to put this in your pocket and butter your biscuit no you're not but um it, you know it is what it is it's not an entry-level tool this i i have people that actually uh, customers that carry these and you know they'll go on hikes and carry them on their belts and stuff i don't see how they do it i put them on a pack or i put mine in my vehicle and that's where they're at but right. uh they you know they it's a it's a considerable piece of uh equipment it's almost two pounds they're 16 inches long it's a quarter inch uh thick it's a big piece of uh it's a big piece of gear but uh for what it's made for I haven't been able to find anything that that has rivaled it, but uh, yeah, it's not. Uh, so uh, I had people ask me for years to make a smaller version of it, and I never really wanted to do it because, um, again, I kind of thought that I hit all the things with this by basically making it on a design that i didn't understand but once i understood it i thought man i ought to make a smaller one <laughs> so uh that's that's what we're getting to now with the m14 which i don't have any here i've just Ooh, now cool. gotten yeah started to make some of those so that's a it's a cool. smaller version of this that's exciting that's actually really cool um uh, what what what's the process <clears throat> how do you make these uh well believe it or not when i very first started these just like everything else i uh, these are quarter inch pieces of steel that i cut out every one of them on a bandsaw Ugh. and that's not knife making folks that is that is uh hating life so <laughs> um and how i do with most all of my knives anymore uh except for my smaller ones i cut everything out uh by hand but uh these m18 since they are so big uh, I do have them water jetted. Now, when I have them water jetted, that does a few things for me. 
uh, one, now that the water, now that they are water jetted, they're all exactly the same. So what I can do for that is now I can start making molds to where I don't have to have um, the knife to make the Kydex sheaths. So now we can make uh, a mold knife or a couple mold knives, and then we can just make Kydex Kydex sheaths all day. And we know that when they get to the knife, they're going to fit because they're all the same. The same thing with my handles. Uh, I got a little CNC uh, gantry uh, CNC that, uh, so I'll make the handles and then we'll turn that into a CAD program. And uh, so now these are what I call, uh, these would be my um, standard versions to where I have uh, the cut out, the CNC handles. So what happens is I get my blank. I stamp the blank with my name, the model number, um, and the serial number on these. And then they go through a first grind pass. So um, the hollow ground is ground. Um, the front convex is ground. All of the, uh, everything is, I you know you can't see this stuff, but all this stuff is uh, chamfered. And um, then it's heat treated. And then after it's heat treated, it goes through that uh, process all again, because I take all of the grinder marks out of it. Uh, even though this one is uh, painted, you can't see it. But if it wasn't painted, you can see that there's no grinder marks in these. These things are actually all taken down to 400 grit, every bit of them. Um, and then w most of them, to what you said, um, they look like they're gray. They're actually acid etched mm -hmm. to help okay. with the uh, with the um, corrosive Corrosion. resistance of the o of the O1. And then the handles are put on, and then they are fitted. So the handles aren't just bolted on and forgotten about. Uh, they are they are fitted, so I make them all just a little bit oversized, and then I come back and sand all the edges, so there's absolutely no hot spots whatsoever on any of these. And then, uh, so that's the M18, and then, uh, so I make everything in batches since I do that. Uh, I get what, you know, like I said, with the repeatability, so therefore, um, instead of just making one knife, I usually make them in batches of six or a dozen. Okay. So everything I make goes in a batch of about uh, six to a dozen. Um, so was was this the knife that was on Naked and Afraid and a couple of uh, other shows? It was, yeah. Um, E.J. Snyder, um, who uh, who now is a consultant for the show, uh, him and I uh, got to be uh, friends. He ended up making a. Uh, he was designing a knife for his adventures that uh, Tops makes called the uh, mm. the uh, Skull Crusher, named right. after. And uh, before he had designed that knife, he was using uh, his M18, and he had taken it on the show, but they had uh, not letting him take it on the show. I guess uh, how that works is. Uh, they give you three things and then it's up to the producer on what you take considering uh, based on what the other person's taken. So mm -hmm. uh, he didn't get to take it, but when he uh, ended up being a consultant for the show, uh, there were some other people and they uh, asked him about some knives and uh, he suggested the M18. So a guy by the name of Zach Buck uh, took it to uh, Guyana and, uh, mm -hmm lopped off the head of a uh, iguana it was pretty neat so <laughs> yeah so i got a picture in my office of a naked man standing with a with a headless iguana in one hand and an m18 in the other oh you too huh yeah yeah <laughs> so, so everybody's like you got a naked dude in your office i was like <laughs> so, yeah, look at the knife so how did you get into this? Uh, how, how, where, where did your love for knives come from? And have you always been a handy person able to build stuff? Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> when I was, uh, growing up, my, uh, my dad was always 
Uh, well, he still is. He's still around. Um, always a real handy guy. Always the type to where, um, why buy it when you can do it yourself? Uh, I would like to say, uh, for lack of a better term, my dad was resourceful. Uh, some people would call that cheap. But uh, so what ended up happening, I guess, was uh, years and years ago, my dad and my uncle used to uh, shoot a traditional muzzleloader. And uh, so my uncle had a patch knife that he'd cut the patch off the top of. And somehow, I don't know how, but my dad broke that knife. And my dad, again, being resourceful, uh, told my uncle that he would replace that knife for him, but he didn't want to, he sure as hell wasn't going to go out and spend money on it. So he was going to make him one. And he uh, got a few things together at work and made him and made my uncle a knife. And uh, I'm sure as, as you as have heard many knife makers say, you know, once it started, you know, it just got the bug and, he uh, made that one and just uh, kind of like me to this day, I, you know, I've made thousands of knives and I still think I can do the next one better. So um, about three years ago, now that was, uh, I'm 49 years old and my dad made that very first knife way before I was even born. Uh, and uh, my uncle gave me that knife about four years ago. So I have it. So it's my dad's very first knife that he ever made. But, uh, yeah, I remember being a small kid. And uh, I just remember, you know, it's like my dad made this uh, workbench in the corner of the garage. And it wasn't a, wasn't a big deal. You know, maybe six inches, six foot long, three foot wide. You know, just something to uh, hammer nails on in the garage. But I remember he built that with just a, a hand saw and uh, some nails. And I just thought, uh, I always paid attention when my dad made stuff. And uh, my mom was one of seven uh, kids and they were all hunters. So um, once my dad made that first knife, he got to the point to where, uh, you know, he would make my uncle's knives out of antlers or something that they'd killed from the deer or something like that every once in a while. And, and uh, it just got to the point to where, you know, the coolest things that my dad ever gave everybody was always wrapped up in shop towels. You know, yeah. dad would give me a knife. The best presents came from dad were always wrapped in shop towels. And so, I mean, that that resonated with me at a, at a young age. It just it, it just really inspired me that how somebody could just take their own two hands and a little bit of ingenuity and a little bit of dedication and, and come out with a, a tool that was so useful and, and something that everybody else admired. And it just stuck with me and just never let go of me. Does your dad still make knives? Yes, he does. He, uh, he is, uh, he's retired now and he makes about, I think last year he made about 42 knives, which is a record for him. That's, that's most he's made in a year, which is doing pretty good, which he doesn't, uh, he doesn't have a whole lot in it. He doesn't make any sheaths. He doesn't like fooling around with leather work. I do all of his heat treating for him and he, uh, he likes, sc uh, scrounging through my materials, you know, where since I'm, since I make a lot of batches, you know, I'm in dad just makes one knife here and there. A lot of times he can kind of go through my scrap bin and mm. pick out some stuff. You know, he, he does it as a hobby, you know? Um, and yeah, he still does it. I do his heat treat for him. He'll come out. And Mom doesn't like any of the mess out at, out at their house. So he makes it out at my shop and she's happy. And <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, yeah, well, everything's coming full circle. <clears throat> Does, but uh, uh, go ahead. No, 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 please. I don't even know what I was going to say now. Uh, well, sorry if I if I shook the thought from your head, but uh, uh, so, but how did you actually learn the the art? It sounds like your dad kind of um, kind of made uh, picked it up as he went and learned from that first <sighs> knife that he made your uncle. Um, but how did you get to really know how to do this? Like, believe it or not, uh, even though it was my dad that got me started on it, uh, as crazy as this is going to sound, uh, it's pretty much self-taught. 
Um, I worked at Cummins Diesel um, for the majority of my adult life, and I had a, a job um, where I worked for their salvage department for their B series engine. It's the uh, the Cummins engine that's in the Dodge pickup trucks, mm. and um, I worked for their salvage shop. They had a transfer line on uh, the block line. So anytime they had a problem uh, machining the blocks, they sometimes they would screw up four or five, sometimes four or 500, sometimes Ooh. four or five blocks. So depending on how many they had screwed up, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't afford to scrap all that. So they'd take them offline and I would fix them by hand. Oh. So like if they had like, um, I don't know, like a lug where one of the holes was busted out or something. I would machine that out of the block and then machine another piece and put it back in the block and do it all by hand. It was an awesome job. Wow. But anyway, I had, uh, I had a, it was just me and two other people. And I had that job for 12 years and we had every piece of equipment known to man. And, uh, you know, it was all, during, you know, I learned from card carrying, uh, tool and die makers, people, you, you know, uh, I learned from the people that have to read the dials and turn them. And, you know, now the it's all everything CNC and what had happened was this equipment that I was working on. A lot of it was, uh, was old stuff. I had a Pratt and Whitney piece of, uh, uh, equipment. If you're familiar with Pratt and Whitney, I mean, uh, plane engines, right? Yeah. Yeah. It was actually a piece of equipment. It was a horizontal, uh, jig bore made by Pratt and Whitney to do their radial, uh, aircraft engines. We had one in there that we did, uh, cylinder bores on. And, uh, so, uh, I, I got to learn from the people that really knew how to do the stuff and, uh, then they got into the age to where everything is push button and CNC numerically controlled. They took all of that old equipment and did away with it. And then they brought all these uh, machining centers, these Mazak centers. They wanted to be able to, they didn't want that job to be a, um, a skilled traits job. So they did away with all of the card carrying uh, tool and die people and then brought in all these machine centers to where uh, any booger picking person off the street could come just, you know, load the machine, press a button. That's how they wanted everything. So they did away with all my stuff. So I ended up uh, transferring to another company or another plant, same company, another plant. Uh, it was absolute hell. And that's why I ended up quitting and going full time. That's a whole nother story. But, uh, to get back to your question, um, so I was running mills and lathes um, my whole adult life. Um, when I very first went to college, I went to college for uh, aircraft uh, maintenance and engineering and um, then got uh, out of college, got that job at Cummins and worked uh, through there through um, that salvage shop and their metallurgy shop. And just I have just always been around um i've always had access to the tools i guess mm -hmm. and um that's what i've always just been able to do now as far as the o1 goes everybody uh i'm kind of known for um my o1 heat treatment which i'm not trying to sound too smart i like that's kind of like saying you're the uh, I don't, I don't know how to, how to say it without being too derogative, but it's like being the smartest dumbass, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, uh, actually what we use the O one for and, and how I got uh, to learn, uh, the toughness of O one is that's actually what they used, um, on, we use these, uh, O one for these, uh, indicator pads to where these blocks would come and sit down on and they would come and sit down on these pads hundreds of times a day. So of course they had to be, uh, re you know, repeat. So they needed this really strong, uh, stuff. So they had a special little treatment for some old one that they used on those, on that stuff and this. So, uh, it was really some, some fascinating little secrets and tidbits you can take from, uh, 
other walks of uh, yeah. life and you can kind of incorporate it into other things and uh, works out pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what I, uh, that's what I tell uh, younger people. And in this case, uh, my daughter, uh, when she thinks about what she's going to want to do. And and a lot of people, a lot of kids these days, uh, <laughs> I hate to say I'm that guy saying kids these days, but uh, think that they can skip a whole bunch of steps. Uh, but really, every, every meaningless job you have along the way, every little job that you think you're not getting anything out of is teaching you something for the big show. Hopefully you have something that you're aiming for, whether it's knife making or something else. But every little job you do helps you get there. For you, going pro, so to speak, going full-time knife maker, what was that like? Uh, well, it was odd because um, I will say I got I – got, because everybody's like, well, well what, what was that like? And um, – it's not anything what I expected because I, I kicked this around I, because where I was at my, my job at Cummins, I was where I was at in seniority. I was pretty much untouchable. I could have wrote it out. I could have been, you know, I could have, uh, you know, been okay. And, but it just got to the point to where I knew that someday down the line, I knew that, I always had people say, well, what are you doing here? You know, you got this talent, you got this skill you, and people really get in your head and they did me. And I'll, I'll be honest with you. And, and I hope people uh, listen to this that might be thinking about going full time. I got cocky. Uh, I'm like, yeah, well, I, you know, I know I can do this, which I knew I could. And um, I knew that there'd be some struggles. And I knew that I would do whatever I could to uh, get through them because that's just the way that I am. And that's the way that I do things. Um, and uh, I was right. There's a lot of things that are that are a little bit more difficult um, than I thought. Like, uh, you know, the whole business aspect of it. The easiest thing I do all day is make knives. That's the easiest thing I do. If you ask me, the easiest thing I do is it's go to a grinder and make a knife. That's the easiest thing I do all day. Um, everything else, uh, running around, worried about your, you know, uh, materials, you know, your shipping, keep, keeping people happy. And, you know, everybody, uh, it's it's difficult. I, I wish I had hours and hours and hours to tell you guys, you know, what the good thing is and what the bad thing is. I, I just knew that my age, that I knew that someday down the road that I would be sitting somewhere on a porch or something and I would always regret. And I would think, you know, if I didn't do this, I'm going to sit someday and think what would happen if I did, if I would have, uh, so I know I won't have that problem now because, you know, I did it, but do your homework, uh, is all I've got to say. I, I, I love to see people, um, do things that they want to do. I love people. I love to see people be successful. I love people to, uh, uh, you know, I, I love the metaphorical, Hey, this sucks. I'm going to do better. Uh, but when you do that, be sure you're all in and be sure that all your T's are crossed and your I's are dotted because there's, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's an adventure. That's for sure. It's a serious commitment. Uh, you were talking about cocky. Um, and when you first said I was cocky it made me think like, oh my God, look at that Bowie. That's gorgeous. Uh, but <clears throat> excuse me, uh, when you said, when you said cocky, it made me think at first, like, uh, really you, sometimes you need that cockiness to, to, to get you to where you need to go. Because like, if you, it can be very daunting to, uh, to fully research everything you don't know. And, um, uh, a lot of people put barriers in their way, uh, by doing that. So I think that cockiness can sometimes be good, not knowing what you're getting into, uh, because you may have stayed with Cummins. I, and you know, if I, if I could have, 
I would, I'd still be at Cummins if I was, uh, if they hadn't done away with that one job that I was telling you about. And what ended up happening was uh, I worked on their block line and, and uh, um, it, it was a, it was a seniority shop and that company had a, uh, a freeze on hiring for 30 years. And after that 30 years of uh, uh, hiring freeze, I was the third group to come back in from, uh, from their third hiring group after a 30 year freeze. So I was like untouchable in seniority because the only people that was above me in seniority were the ones that had hired in, you know, after they got out of NOM. And, uh, so, uh, and the thing of it was, but once they did away with that job, uh, they also turned on, uh, where you could transfer from other to other plants and they had another plant two miles from my house. I was driving 20, 25 miles at this other place. So the thought was that I could transfer and be two miles from the house. And since I had higher seniority, I could get me a, a really easy job and live out the rest of my years there. But how that ended up happening was, uh, it was it being a union job. And since I came in there, uh, there were 600 people in that plant and I had more seniority than every one of them. So therefore I could walk right in there and, and be eligible for the better jobs than they were. And, uh, they didn't like that. So how that works was I had 600 union brothers and sisters that hated my guts every day I walked in there. And then uh, management, you know, like I said, I had worked with the old card carrying um, tool and die makers, and that was a union shop. And uh, it worked very well as a union shop. They weren't harassed and they were valued and they did a good job. And uh, this other plant, since it was filled with the younger generation, they didn't understand this and they just walked all over uh, those employees. They just walked all over them and they tried to do that with me. And then I understood that they couldn't do that. So, I mean, I walked into a plant every day where 800 people just absolutely hated my guts. And you do that every day for three years and it just turns you into a different person. And my right. wife, my wife's like, man, just quit. If you think you can do this knife gig, then you can do it. And th that's been one of the one of the coolest things I ever remember. I, I can't remember who said it, but, uh, you know, if you think you can or you can't, you're probably right. You're and, right. And I've always been that way. If, if I can figure out a way to do something in my mind, I know I can do it, e even if I haven't done it. And like I said, I knew I could do this, but I knew that there was going to be some struggles and some strifes, and, and there are. But... Uh, yeah, it's uh, it took me two years uh, to get to the point to where I finally uh, was on the fence. And I'll tell you what ended up uh, what ended up uh, really making me decide uh, to go ahead and do it was uh, my son. One day I used to coach his baseball uh, team. And, uh, we were talking one time and I asked him, I said, well, what do you think you're going to do when you get big little buddy? And he said, well, I goes, daddy, I'd like to be a baseball player, but he goes, I don't think I'll ever be able to do that. I said, why not? He goes, well, I probably won't be able to, you know, he just kind of, you know, he, he, just a little kid, you know, kind of down the dumps. He goes, well, I just don't think I'd ever be any good at it. And I was like, man. And then I just got to thinking that, that one day I didn't say anything to him, but I thought, man, I, here I am trying to tell this kid that he can do anything and the world that he wants to and then his dad ain't got the balls to do it himself so uh yes, so i did yes, I, I i went in and uh turned in my notice uh the the next couple days after that and uh my son just got out of marine boot camp so <laughs> he Congratu to, congratulations yeah. on that yeah. and, and well, I think what you described there, um, you know, I have felt before. I'm sure everyone who's a parent has felt that before. It's like, man, here I am lecturing this kid about doing something that, you know, I, I, I need to take my own advice on. Yeah. So, so 20, 2013 is when <clears throat> TM Hunt Custom Knives officially began. How how have you seen, I mean, you've you've hinted at some of the strife of being a small business owner and a maker what have you seen uh, on the outside world? How has the knife market 
uh, changed or how has the knife world and community changed in that period of time? You know, that's a good question uh, that I would like to hear somebody else answer because I don't really know because, uh, and I've talked to other makers about this and I think they know what I mean, but it's like, I don't get out of my cage to see everybody talks about the knife community and what's out there. And, and I'm like, man, I don't, w what is this place you're talking about? You know, <laughs> um, I, I, I really, it seems like the knife community is, uh, I've had, I, I've been fortunate enough to have some really good friends in the knife community and some of them that are people that are very well known in the knife community that have completely told me exactly what to expect through my years of, uh, uh what to expect. And they were exactly right. It's like when I very first got into this, this community was the best thing I met. I've met friends and I've still got friends that I know that I'll have for the rest of my life. And then it gets to a point to where people realize that you're not going to go away. And then people stop being so nice. And then people realize that you're competition. And then they really stop being nice. And then it's like you've passed a, a rite of passage because you've been that nuisance for so long. And then you just kind of, everything kind of levels off and exists. But as far as, uh, the knife community and what's happening and what's going on out there, man, I'm just as clueless now as I am when I started, because it seems like anytime I, I've noticed that, um, uh, a lot of things come, uh, timing with, with the knife community. A lot of things are timing and I've mm -hmm. never been able to get my timing right because it's like, like, for example, like at blade show, one year something sells that's hot cakes that you can't keep on your table. So the next year you make more of them and they set. And it's like that every year. And with everybody I talk to, nobody can ever, can ever get exactly what the next trend's going to be, what the next thing's going to be. You know, I, I made, uh, you know, just like uh, I used to make a bunch of these little knives called the little leave it to be, uh, leave it to cleavers, the little cleavers. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I used to make, I, I made so many of those things. I got sick and tired of making them. And every time I would take those, you know, they would go, uh, in seconds at blade show. And I took a handful of those one time and they set, and then the guy right next to me was selling pocket spinners, little bear nah. pocket spinners for, <laughs> yeah. for $450. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. There was a cleaver craze and then cleaver craze. There was a, well, I mean, people still like cleaver knives, but you know what I mean. Uh, when they first came out, everything cleaver, 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 cleaver. Yeah, but same uh, thing with the damn spinners. The spinners, but uh, it's just like uh, everybody asked me what my opinion is of the next big thing and and what's coming out, and I was like, man, what's out there now? You, you know, I don't know because I'll talk to people and everybody's. You know, like other knives, like, I, you know, like I like ZTs and I, but I never can keep up with the ZT numbers. I'm like, oh, well, what do you carry? Oh, well, I got a ZT. Oh, well, what is it? I don't know. It's this one right here. Oh, well, I like the 609 536. I'm like, okay, well, that's, I'm sure that's great. But I, I don't, people think, well, you know, you make your living with knives. You think you could be a little bit more versed. I'm like, dude, when I get home at nighttime, yeah. I, you know, I, take a shower, eat my supper. Uh, you know, I'm not on the internet looking at knives. Yeah. Right. I, I, I see them all day. Uh, but you know, and people even, s I, I, I don't, I really don't know what's out there as weird as what it sounds. I'm just not out of my cage that much. As far as I tell you what I would like to see come back is more popularity with, uh, like the stuff that I was into when I, the stuff that got me interested, uh, like, uh, grandpa's Barlow in his pocket, you know, my grandpa used to take me down fishing for bluegill and he'd always get out a Barlow out of his pocket mm -hmm. to cut the fishing line out of, you know, and then, you know, after a few times of fishing, you know, grandpa would give you the pocket knife, tell you, keep, put that in your pocket. You know, th those were big things for me when I was yeah. a kid. 
Um, and that's, you know, ultimately that was why, uh, you know, those, those memories and then, you know, being, um, just amazed by my dad's talents of being able to do things with his hands and, and just the memories of, uh, of good tools and the value of them. And I, you know, I just remembered, you know, when I was a little kid watching dad, you know, dad would have, uh, knife magazines around the house. We lived, uh, about a quarter of a mile from, uh, a shopping center and where mom and dad used to get their groceries. And I'm probably showing my age here, but back then you used to ride your bicycles up to hooks, you know, and buy a candy bar and anymore. You wouldn't do that because you'd worry that somebody would run off with your kid, but we'd always go up there and we'd always see the, uh, blade magazines way back then. And, uh, hell Ed Fowler was a writer for him then, which he mm -hmm. still is. And I remember being a little kid, always seeing those Ed Fowler knives and just saying, oh, man, I'd always wanted one, but I knew I'd never be able to afford one. So that's how I started even uh, like looking at the file work and in the engravings and stuff like that. I thought, man, I knew I'd never be able to afford any of that stuff. So I started looking at, well, what do, what do these guys do to, to be able to do this stuff and be able to make this stuff? And, you know, just kind of started figuring out how to do it out of necessity because I knew I wouldn't be able to afford to do it. Well, where, where do you, uh, you know, as we wrap here, where do you want to see TM Hunt custom knives? Uh, how, what are the things you want to do with the company or with your work or knives you want to build? Uh, what, what's in, in store for the future? What I would like to do is just basically uh, what I'm doing now, except for just a little bit more of it. I've got a, a complete line of knives uh, that are all of my design. Um, the ones that I sell the most of are my most popular models, my Hedgehogs, my Mogwas, my Yumas, Tradewaters, uh, M14s now, and M18s. And I just want to keep on making those. Um, I don't, uh, and just sending them to my dealers. I just want to get more proficient uh, and better at making those and sending those to my dealers and then just uh, doing, uh, what I really like to do is stuff that I don't have the time to do anymore. Like uh, I really like ornate bowies. I like really weird stuff. I like off the wall stuff. I like, um, uh, I've done some brass back bowies that, um, uh, I haven't done a brass back in a long time and I've really got a hankering for another one of those. Um, so I guess what I want to do is just more of what I'm doing now, just have the, the model knives be kind of like my bread and butter, my living, uh, here they are, they're available for purchase, uh, through one of my dealers or through my website. Um, uh, you know, here they are and then just, uh, make stuff on the side that I like and then, uh, put some extra time in, uh, uh, set supply, which is another little side hustle that, uh, myself and Ed and uh, a third person have going on with, uh, handle material and just, uh, kind of, uh, put a little bit of extra time in that Ed and I would like to, uh, start offering uh, some classes uh, to where people can pick out uh, said model of knife and come on uh, a weekend and uh, leave with that knife that you That's make. That's a cool idea. Yep. So, so um, I would like to do that. I would like to, you know, cause I'm, I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I'll be 50 uh, this February and um you know, I've devoted my life to this, so I'm not going anywhere. Um, so I would, I would like to, uh, get to the point to where, uh, I would like to pass on some of this knowledge and just, uh, just, uh, see what I can do to add to the community, I guess. Well, Todd, you said, uh, off the wall designs and, uh, some, some of the things you'd like to be doing in the future. And, and, uh, as, as I, 
as I close, I would like to say the M18 to me um, and and soon to be the M14 are off the wall designs, but they're so they seem to be. I've never used one so practical that that off the wall isn't off the wall. It's just unusual, unique and um, very, very cool. So, Todd, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure talking with you, sir. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad we finally we finally got together. Me too. All righty, sir. Thanks. I'm also uh, uh, glad I got a chance to check out your work in the brain shovel before it went off uh, far afield. All righty, sir. You have a good one. You as well. Thank you. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Todd Hunt of TM Custom Knives. Uh, be sure to check him out on Instagram. You can see some of his work there, but also uh, on his website. And, uh, man, beautiful stuff. We didn't even talk about his his uh, his other fixed blade knives. We will in our little uh, extra interview here we have for Patreon uh, members, so be sure to check that out. For Jim Work and his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.